Let's talk about super compensation and muscle growth. Is it fact or is it fiction? Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel and today I'm diving into a fascinating paper by Bjornsson and colleagues published in 2019. This study examined adaptations to very high frequency resistance training, working the same muscle group five days per week. Interestingly, this study is what led many conversations on social media around the concept known as supercompensation. Specifically, there was some suggestion that this was the first study to show evidence of a supercompensation effect for muscle growth. So let's dive in and see what the authors found. So for those who are not familiar, the compensation hypothesis is a way of describing how the body adapts to resistance training. It is essentially a transposition of the general adaptation syndrome, a broader biological model focusing on stress and recovery. Ah, uh, yes, let me explain. So in this framework, a workout is said to often cause a temporary decline in an often undefined variable during exercise and recovery after exercise. This drop could be performed capacity or any other physiological variable. During recovery, the system not only returns to baseline, but it overshoots, a rebound called supercompensation. According to this concept, with proper training and timing, you'll gradually push performance or adaptation higher and higher. This model has been used for decades to explain resistance training adaptation, but unfortunately, it has several fundamental problems. In fact, it does not accurately describe how muscles really adapt to resistance exercise. So what are they, you might be wondering? Well, there are three major flaws which have been proposed. First, supercompensation is really just a time course. It's not a true mechanism. It describes a pattern of change, but it doesn't explain the biological process that actually drives muscle growth. Second, we know that tissues don't require this dip and rebound pattern to adapt and grow. Just think about the heart, for example. It contracts tens and thousands of times every single day without rest days, yet the heart is able to remodel and adapt in remarkably robust ways. And third, decades of molecular physiology research show that muscle hypertrophy is governed by signaling pathways, things like satellite cell activity and myonuclear changes, not by a rebound after breakdown. So despite the lack of mechanistic support for supercompensation, a study published in 2019 by Bjornsson and colleagues re-sparked interest in the possibility of supercompensation for muscle growth. Specifically, some of their results followed a pattern that resembled supercompensation, meaning the authors saw this characteristic pattern in the changes of some of the variables. In this experiment, participants trained their quadriceps at an extremely high frequency over a short period of time. While muscle growth was minimal during the intervention, it appeared to increase days after the intervention was complete. To some folks, this appeared like the long-dismissed supercompensation model playing out in real life. So in today's video, I'll break down exactly what the authors did, what they found, and whether their results really point to a supercompensation of muscle growth or whether a different explanation makes more sense. So let's take a look at the methods. What did the authors do? To investigate how muscles adapt to high-frequency, low-load blood flow restriction training, the researchers designed a study with two intensive training blocks. Each block consisted of seven training sessions spread across five consecutive days. For the first three days, the participants trained once only, and for the final two days, they trained twice per day. Right after this demanding block, the participants rested for 10 full days before completing a second five-day block with the same schedule, bringing the total up to 14 training sessions per leg. During each block, participants completed seven exercise sessions over the five-day period. The figure on the screen shows the study's timeline along with when all the measurements were taken. So if you take a look at the key along the bottom of the image, you'll see two shaded up arrows and these represent muscle biopsies and strength testing. Now you can also see that there are two shaded down arrows and these represent blood samples and ultrasounds and where they took place across the study. The training protocol involved unilateral knee extension, otherwise known as a leg extension. These were performed with blood flow restriction applied at the proximal part of their thigh. 
The load was set at 20% of their one rep max and all sets were carried out to failure. Now there were a range of measurements used in this study to track training adaptations. Ultrasound imaging was performed to measure the quadriceps cross-sectional area and this took place at baseline during each training day, throughout the 10 day recovery week and on several separate occasions after the final training session. Muscle biopsies were also collected from the vastus lateralis of both legs, alternating between sides to reduce the total number of samples being taken per leg. Biopsies were taken at baseline one hour after the first training session of each block and at rest on the fourth day of each block, then during the recovery period and again three and ten days after the second training block. These biopsy samples allowed for analysis of myonuclear content, satellite cell activity and muscle fiber size. Now moving on to strength assessments, one rep maximum knee extension was also measured at baseline and again after each training block and recovery period to determine how performance changed over time. Together with other data, the researchers were able to examine not only the structural and cellular adaptations, but also functional outcomes in response to the training protocol. So let's take a look at the results. The results painted an interesting and somewhat conflicting picture depending on which measurement was used. Ultrasounds of the quadricep cross-sectional area suggested a fairly steady and progressive increase throughout the training blocks. Even during periods of very high training frequency, muscle size appeared to rise continuously. So on the surface, this might suggest that hypertrophy was gradually occurring as sessions accumulated, but the biopsy data told a very different story. At the muscle fiber level, cross-sectional area did not increase in the same continuous fashion. Instead, individual fiber hypertrophy was delayed, even showing a slight decrease during day four and during the rest week, with little change during the actual training intervention itself. The most pronounced fiber growth was observed only after the recovery particularly in the days following that second training block. This delayed remodeling coincided with a significant rise in myonuclear content and satellite cell activity, suggesting that the cellular machinery needed time to catch up before meaningful hypertrophy could occur. Strength testing mirrored the fiber level findings much more closely than the ultrasound results. Strength of the knee extensors showed minimal improvements during the training blocks, with some participants even showing signs of fatigue-related suppression. The largest strength gains appeared after the recovery period, aligning with the fiber hypertrophy and myonuclear changes rather than the continuous ultrasound increases. So to summarize the results, while ultrasound measures of muscle thickness suggested steady growth throughout this intervention, the fiber level and strength data showed that functional and some structural adaptations were quite delayed until after rest. This highlights that different measurement tools can tell different parts of the story and that recovery might be an important consideration when designing an intervention. So what does this all mean? Well, what makes this study so fascinating is the different methods of measuring muscle hypertrophy, the ultrasound and the biopsy, and that they didn't tell the same story. On one hand, ultrasound scans suggested a continuous increase in muscle cross-sectional area across the training blocks, almost as if the muscles were steadily growing throughout the sessions. On the other hand, the biopsy data, which reflects changes at the level of the individual fibres, showed that hypertrophy was largely delayed, only emerging after a period of recovery and perhaps tied to the delayed appearance of the myonuclei. This discrepancy highlights an important point. Imaging and cellular data don't always align. Ultrasound depicted gradual growth, yet biopsy data took longer to manifest. In this case, the fiber level data seemed to better explain the time course of the functional improvements since strength gains also appeared mainly after recovery, not during any of the five-day training blocks with heavy lifting. However, a lot of research has demonstrated that changes in muscle size and strength are not perfectly coupled. So the fact that the strength data lines up better with the fiber data does not prove that the fiber data is more accurate than the ultrasound measured in the present study. In their conclusion, the authors suggest that the initial myofiber atrophy followed by a delayed hypertrophy and strength increases are reminiscent of the supercompensation observed after periods of overreaching. However, we need to be careful before making such a conclusion. Without control groups to better understand the measurement error in this research, we don't know if the fiber level data is actually more reliable than the ultrasound measures of muscle growth. For example, isn't it possible that the ultrasound data provides a better picture of training adaptations than the fiber level data. 
Also, if growth was in fact delayed, was this actually a super compensation or simply an upregulation of the machinery associated with muscle growth? After all, the super compensation hypothesis of adaptation suggests that depression of variable helps create super compensatory effects. Certainly, we don't have to decrease muscle size to facilitate muscle growth. So what are my key takeaways from this study? Well, the main takeaway here is that while this study has been interpreted as evidence for muscle supercompensation, the results don't actually prove this is what's happened. Ultrasound suggested muscle size increased steadily, but the fibre level and strength data showed growth mainly after recovery. That delay could look like supercompensation, but it could also just reflect the time needed for satellite cells and myonuclei to catch up before hypertrophy occurred. Now, without control groups and with conflicting measurement tools, it's hard to say for certain. What we can say with confidence is that recovery played a key role in these training adaptations and cranking up training frequency doesn't necessarily speed up muscle growth. So what do you guys think? Does this look like super compensation to you or is it just delayed remodeling after an intense block of training? And question for you, have you ever noticed your best progress coming after a recovery phase or a deload? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like today's video, subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss my next deep dive into the latest training and nutrition research. Now, if you'd like to support my channel and learn more about muscle growth, I invite you to explore my recent book publication, The Complete Exercise Guide to Muscle Hypertrophy. This comprehensive resource will help you improve your understanding of muscle growth, detailing the mechanisms behind muscle development, the role of hormones, an in-depth discussion on muscle memory, rest periods, volume, sex differences, and so much more. Priced at just $59, it offers graduate level education at an exceptional value. To purchase your copy, please visit my website. Thank you for watching guys, and I'll see you in my next video.